Okay, we're live apparently, hopefully. Okay, let me know guys if you can hear me in the comments quickly. That would be very helpful. Can you see me? Yeah, can you hear me? I've got no speakers running at the moment so I can't hear myself. Yay. Yeah, well, uh, our Prime Minister is doing a speech right now actually, so um, a lot of UK viewers I guess will be watching him. But hello everyone, good evening, welcome to this live stream, uh, really excited to be here now, I think this is the sixth or the seventh week in a row. Last week we did the workshop creating this lovely little aqua cube here. I hope you enjoyed that. We had a record audience. I think at one point there was over 500 people watching. So it was great to see such great engagement. I hope there's going to be some good engagement this evening. Um, before we get started, uh, if there's going to be lots of questions and answers session this evening. So um, it's very likely that I won't be able to answer uh, many of the questions on here. So if there are experienced folk in the chat, then please help out the other guys if you can um, use, the, use the chat and answer some questions for those if you could, that'd be amazing. Thanks to my moderators, Candy, Lizzie and Radu, if indeed they are here, I hope they are, to help out. Yes, yes they are, looks like it already. Audio is from camera, not from microphone again, oh my. Honestly. I actually did it. Worked and now it's not working again. How's that, guys? Sorry about that. So embarrassing. Okay, is that? Can I? Can everyone hear me? Okay, I've just unplugged everything and plugged it back in. It's important we get the audio right from the start because otherwise it just sounds terrible. Okay, good. It must be a loose connection. Do apologise. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can see the AquaCube here, which we did last week. Uh, the 1200 is looking great, as you can see. Um, the more observant of you could notice this uh, other twin star unit. So I've got a twin star 1200 running the length of the tank, and then I've got a twin star 600 running the width of the tank front to back. And the reason for that is I really want to get the best stem plant growth possible around the center, really get super red, intense colors on those stems because I'm hopefully going to do another photo shoot on this already for the IEA PLC contest at the end of this month, which is, what, three weeks away? So I've got three weeks to grow those stems back as well as I can. So that's why I've got two lights on there, really highlighting. The plants are purling like crazy. You can see probably see the oxygen bubbles uh, in, the, in the stream. And, yeah, consequently adding a little bit more fertiliser, more CO2, more water changes because of the more light and that is an interesting kind of learning point there you know you have to keep things in balance the more light you have for your plants the more the plants want to grow light is the main driving force behind plant growth and so you have to balance that extra light out with extra food for the plants the number one food is carbon which they get from carbon dioxide and then all of the macro and micronutrients so macronutrients are things like nitrogen phosphorus potassium um, that's the main three. Then there's magnesium, calcium, things like that. And then trace elements such as iron, copper, molybdenum, boron, manganese. Uh, so anyway, you just have to balance it all out. And we'll get onto more kind of nutrient and fertilizer uh, topic later because there's some great Q&As about that. So just a quick update of the 1200. Um, I did set up an Awaze style line one, two, five. Those that follow me on Instagram may have seen that. It's a very brief kind of glimpse. That is going to be published fully on the Awaze YouTube channel and their Instagram. So make sure you follow those guys on there to get the first kind of uh, first look. And then I will publish a full on video on my own channel of that as well. The Starline 85 has got fish in and the Flea Valve Flex has got fish in now. So you might have seen the Flea Valve Flex update video on the Tropica channel. And I will be doing a, an update on the, the Starline 85 on my own channel soon as well. You, some of you may have noticed I've not done so much content 
uh, full, fully produced videos on my channel recently. I have been busy finishing off the book. Um, I keep telling you this, I'm finishing off the book. Uh, it is happening. I've literally written the last words now and it's a case of getting all the photos together and then some very minor edits going to and from the editor. And yeah, it's really, really close and due to be released in November this year. So that's really exciting. Okay, so I did publish on my Instagram story this morning. Um, ask me any question and I'll read out the best 10 questions for this Q&A. So I have 10 great questions here, which we'll run through to start with. And then uh, if you do want to drop any super chats, I really appreciate that. But do that towards the end uh, when you want to ask your own questions. And then I'll do my best to answer you guys as well. So um, you don't necessarily have to give a super chat to get your question answered. It's just a very easy way for me to identify that you definitely want a question being answered. So um, thanks, Candy, for all the links. Epic work as almost, uh, as always even. Um, what I'm going to do now is just make sure everything is good in the chat. There's no dramas. Looks like we've got the moderating team in there. Thanks very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. Good, all good. Cube looks great, thank you very much. Yes, excellent. Okay, so the top 10 questions um, in no particular order. Let's start off with question number one. This is from Zephyr Moy. Uh, apologies if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. Zephyr Moy says, snails, what's your take on them? So this is a great question because, you know, some people are massive fans of snails, some people absolutely hate them. And I actually fall in between. I, th I think there's, there's kind of two main brackets of snails. You can say there's helpful snails and there's pest snails. So I would class helpful snails such as nearite snails. So I actually use these in almost all my aquascopes now. These are great at cleaning algae. Uh, they're really great at grazing uh, the hardscape in particular and um, more kind of robust plants for really kind of stubborn algae, which a lot of alg other algae eaters won't eat, like a mano shrimp or cherry shrimp or ottos. They really can get that really stubborn stuff away. So really great for rocks in particular. So if you've got an Iwagumi aquascape, the nearite snails are perfect for that. And that is the act actually the only really, the snail that I like to keep personally. Other kind of useful snails, you could argue, are assassin snails, which eat other pest snails. Uh, apple snails, I think, are illegal in the UK now, so we can't really talk about that. Malaysian trumpet snails, there's two schools of thought there. Some people really like them, some people hate them. They do tend to breed prolifically and can soon overpopulate your aquarium. But the advantage is, is that they tend to stay in the substrate during the daylight, during the photo period, so you don't really see them. And actually, they, they eat decomposing matter, and they help to keep the substrate kind of oxygenated or aerated if you've got you know a very deep layer of substrate and perhaps you haven't got the best uh, plant root growth to keep it oxygenated and those snails can be helpful for that pest snails are like the tiny little ram's horn snails or the bladder snails these tend to breed out of control quite easily i do have um, quite a lot of bladder snails in here uh, but i just keep them under control by um, not feeding, overfeeding the, the fish, and every water change, I just use it as an opportunity to siphon any bladder snails that I can quite easily see out just using a small uh, siphon hose. So at any one time, there's, there's quite a few bladder snails in there, but it's never enough to really spoil the aesthetic of the aquascape. And even though they kind of breed and, and kind of can overpopulate an aquarium, they do serve a purpose. Um, contrary to popular belief, Snails don't tend to eat healthy plants. They'll only eat decomposing plants. So um, if, if you're finding your plants are getting big holes in them, it's probably not the snails. It could even be a mano shrimp. A mano shrimp, when they're really hungry, will actually eat plants and they favour some plants more than others. They tend to really like Altonanthera, for instance. So that's my kind of thought on snails. Thanks for the question, Zephyr Moy. Uh, Seb Butcher, question number two asks, how do I stop lime scale lines building up on the aquarium glass? So this is really common with, especially with open top rimless tanks. Evaporation is a lot more apparent, of course, because 
you've got an open top and there's, it just evaporates away. And then as it evaporates, especially if you have harder water, the harder, the more mineral content of the water, the more lime scale or hard water deposit it's going to leave behind. Now there isn't uh, an easy way to, to stop it. it. If you've got hard water, you will always get some mineral buildup on the glass. It's just something you have to learn to live with. Um, but what I do is religiously, uh, with during every water change, I will clean all around the rim and clean the, and clean the hard water marks off. I actually use a Denele Cleanator. Um, I might have one actually to show you if you guys have, um, if you guys have not seen one. Here we are, still in its packet. It's helpful. So this isn't a sponsored video or anything. This is generally what I actually buy myself to uh, to use. Real big fan of these. They're not cheap. I think they're they're about five pounds, about six or seven bucks. Um, and they have a they have like a soft um, wire wool backing, which doesn't scratch the glass at all, but it really shifts any hard water marks or algae really really easily. So this is my absolute go-to algae cleaning tool. Um, that in conjunction with a credit card to slide in between the substrate and the glass and the plants there, and a toothbrush to clean the silicon in the corners. That's all I use to clean my algae. I don't use algae magnets. I tend to find if they get like a tiny, one tiny little grain in between the magnet and the glass, you'll just end up with scratches everywhere. And this, this, this has been scratched loads already even without using a magnet. So that's what I do to clean, uh, clean the hard water marks off and just some other tips about cleaning algae, etc. So thanks for the question, Seb Butcher. Okay, question number three, K7YB, I guess that's KTB. Um, which look do I prefer, open top aquariums or hooded? Uh, so we've just alluded to the rimless aquariums with evaporation, etc. And the other type of aquarium, which I have just behind the camera, is, is the, we're using the Iwase aquariums and the Fluval Flex. They've all got hoods. From an aesthetic point of view, and I'm talking purely from an aesthetic point of view, absolutely, I prefer the rimless tank, open top tank. As an aquascaper, I'm a really big fan of just literally having almost this illusion of a floating column of water. And then you have glassware, you have suspended lighting, you can have wood and plants growing out the top of the tank. You can look into the aquascape without a hood and that there's loads of advantages to it from a visual aesthetic perspective. So if, if I could only live with one aquarium or another, it would definitely be, this is another example of rimless or an open top tank, uh, the aqua cube. It would be a rimless, but I, I still like hooded tanks because they offer uh, several advantages over a, a rimless tank. So the the number one I would suggest is that you can stock a wider variety of fish. A lot of fish will want to jump from an open top tank. So you need to choose your fish, fish selection carefully. You know, obviously with a, a covered tank, that isn't an issue. Evaporation is, is much more reduced in a hooded tank and you, uh, they maintain uh, temperature better as well. So you won't need to use so much energy heating your aquarium water, especially you live, if you live in a cooler home. So as with most things in the hobby, it's down to a matter of taste, a budget, uh, your end goal, uh, what fish you want to keep uh, and what kind of style you're after, etc. So there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but just to summarise, from an aesthetic point of view, I prefer rimless, maybe from a more practical point of view, a hooded tank. Uh, OK, question number five. Everyone all right? No stream still running, no dramas. Can everyone still hear me OK? <laughs> Okay, next question, number four, is from Bearded Scape. How to turn aquascaping into a full-time job? Uh, this is probably worth a, a complete live stream on its own, so I'll try to keep it brief. In fact, I did do a video, I don't know if Candy, if you can link to my um, 100,000 subscriber special video. That was quite a lot of detail on how I kind of built my career, uh, the story behind everything. Uh, but just to summarise how to turn aquascaping into a full-time job, there's, there's many, many routes to do it, I would suggest. Um, but what I would probably suggest is one of the easiest is to, is to use it as a side hustle. 
So main, keep, keep your full-time job so you're still financially secure and then just gradually build up your profile on the side as, an, as a full-time aquascaper. Um, so uh, absolutely exploit social media. You know, it's free marketing, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, even YouTube, obviously. They're all free to create accounts and, you know, just really build up a network, a network of like-minded and hobbyists, but also try to build a network of companies and brands. And this is going to help um, you in the longer term kind of maybe do some brand deals um, build up a reputation so you maybe could do some private installations maybe some commercial uh, clients as well and maybe some workshops uh, don't be afraid so is a, is a kind of um, a mixed um, how do I say some conflicting advice about working for free or not in if you're not kind of an entrepreneur um, some people kind of feel it sort of devalues things, but in, in my experience, you know, I offered, I effectively worked for free for years because I was, I wasn't so much working, but putting in the hours, you know, researching, answering loads of questions on forums, posting photos, posting videos, all, all things like this for free to get my kind of reputation built up to the point where I could start asking, you know, for, you know, commercial deals. Um, you know, my, my story, I guess guess my kind of path is quite unique in that I, I kind of got noticed by a magazine, by Practical Fish Keeping, and I started writing for them, and that built up my reputation. So if that's a possible route for you, you could approach a magazine, whether you have an aquarium magazine in your, lo in your country. You could submit an article. If you're a photographer, send some photos along with the article. Hopefully they'll get it published. And then that's like a, you know, a tick in the box on your CV, you know, on your kind of, um, you know, this is this is what I can do. You can approach a shop or a private client, show them the article in the magazine and say, look, I've been published. I can create an aquascape for you. So that's another, you know, that's something else you can consider. But absolutely use social media. Instagram in particular is, is really an easy way to reach a large audience very quickly. Facebook tends to be quite tricky these days. You really have to kind of pay for advertising to get that reach, it seems. And YouTube is a hard graft, I would suggest. If you're just starting out on YouTube, it, is very, it can be very challenging to, to grow quickly. Um, there are some very great success stories, with, especially within the aquarium industry. You know, you have like MD Fish Tanks. He's only been keeping aquariums for a couple of years and he's already uh, reached well over 100,000 subscribers now. So, you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, but you just have to really work for it, really want it, be passionate about it, and put in the hours, make the right networks, meet the right people, have the right attitude, and eventually you can hopefully become uh, a full-time aquascaper. So that's um, a, br a brief uh, kind of way, hopefully, of how you can convert your job into full-time aquascaping. Okay, we've just got a quick super chat that I want to shout out. I did ask if, it'd be great if you could leave them to the end whilst I get through these 10 questions, but Guppy Central, have a brown, almost crumbly algae that sits on my hydrocotyl verticillata. What's the best way to get rid of it? Brown, almost crumbly algae sounds like diatoms. I would literally just rub, it would come off really easily if it is, so just rub it off with your fingers and as you're doing that, siphon it out as part of a water change and then just really focus on great plant growth and as the, as the aquarium matures, it should uh, disappear on its own accord. Okay, so next question. We have uh, da, 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 aqua blooming. I almost always use crips. Do I, do I have a tip to prevent crip melt? Uh, yes, um, there is a tip, but I don't actually use it. You can literally cut all the leaves off the rootstock. So when you get your crypts, you prepare with the pot and you'll, you'll notice a big kind of heavy root system, hopefully if it's a healthy crypt, then you'll have the stems with the leaves coming off. It sounds brutal, but if you get a sharp pair of scissors, just trim off all of the leaves that down to almost down, right down to near the rootstock, just plant that rootstock and then the new growth will be readily adapted to your aquarium water parameters and you shouldn't get any melt because that new growth has adapted to your aquarium. So the potential issue is when you buy crypts from a store, 
They're often in their immersed state, so they're growing out of water, which makes them uh, physiologically very different to the submerged state. And what can happen is as it as it adapts from this emerged to sub immersed to submerged, um, it can struggle. And then um, one of the symptoms of that is that it melts. The leaves literally disintegrate. Um, but good news, once that leaf's disintegrated, ideally siphon it out, take it out of the aquarium, and then it will promote new growth. You'll get a new leaf that's hopefully ready to adapted. So the top tip is to trim all the leaves off, or you can just wait it out, um, and then you'll get new growth that's readily adapted. Uh, I think for some reason my crypt don't really melt that often. I had a big case of it a few months ago. Some of you may remember the big crypt melt I had in the 1200. Um, and I think that was caused by changing the light suddenly from the Kessels to the Twin Star. Any kind of sudden change in parameters in a, in a mature system can induce this crit melt. Um, but try to keep things stable. Focus on um, just caring for your plants in general and hopefully you won't get that melt. Try to keep the water parameters relatively stable. Okay, number six, Kmar flavour. What are the best water parameters for a high-tech setup? That's a real loaded question. I don't think there is such a thing as best and water parameters. There's definitely a range of water parameters that are more suitable to help promote plant growth, I would suggest. Softer water seems to be beneficial to plants. I think plants can have better utilization of CO2. So if you do have softer water, you, you seem to be able to get away with using less CO2 to get the kind of equivalent growth that's in kind of anecdotal evidence. I don't know if any, any scientific papers out there to suggest to support this kind of um, hypothesis, um, but that's what I've experienced. The, the only one time I did, I used reverse osmosis for a few years and I did get much easier growth. The plants just grew, grew quicker and, and more easily and I, I didn't have any kind of any issues at all really. It was really straightforward. But for me, the trade-off of you know the the kind of extra labour and costs in you know that came about by using reverse osmosis, the the trade-off wasn't worth it when compared with the ease of using hard tap water. So I just use hard tap water now, and as you can see, all the plants are growing really well. There is a caveat to that. I do tend to just use easy plants, generally speaking. Although this Hydrocotyl verticalata here, this is regarded as an advanced plant, and that's growing really well. Um, but with you know good lighting, good CO2, good circulation, good nutrients, good substrate, good maintenance, your water parameters almost don't matter. If you can nail all those kind of five or six components, then it's almost irrelevant your water parameters. But if you really want, it, if you have the ability to tailor make your water, then if I had to say some figures, I would go. I, I don't like to do this because people kind of take it as gospel and then they try to aim for these figures and that can cause more problems that it can solve but for a GH I would probably aim for about five or six and then a KH probably about three or four. Um, CO2 if you're injecting CO2 30 parts per million. Uh, nitrates probably about 10 or 20 parts and then phosphates about one part per million. Uh, if, if I could you know had an easy way to control my water that's probably the ballpark figures that I would aim for. Um, but I don't need to because I change lots of water frequently and I dose more fertilizers than the plants actually need. So by slightly overdosing every day and changing loads of water at least once a week, uh, the, 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 that water is, is ideal for the plant growth. If the plants are growing really well, then very likely everything else is going to be very happy in the aquarium. Of course, you should only stock fish that are suitable for your water parameters, so don't keep super delicate soft water fish in a hard water setup, etc. Uh, aquatic hub, how do I create height in a small aquarium? Um, well, in terms of plants, it sounds obvious, but tall plants at the back and then sort of medium height at the middle ground and then foreground low plants. It's kind of what I do in all, pretty much all my aquascapes. You can slope the substrate more steeply and then you can use hardscape to kind of give you uh, a better sense of depth. Um, but it's this just, I wouldn't say it's any different to use creating depth in the larger aquascape. The principles are exactly the same. So 
you can use um, tr optical tricks like sloping the substrate is a great one using larger textures of the same using larger plant kind of species with the same texture at the foreground and then finer textures in the background that can also create this optical illusion that the tank is deeper than it really is but you're talking about height I think I think you mean maybe depth but uh, hopefully that answers your question mate okay chaos stylation stylation I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong do I have any tips for rescaping an aquascape without tearing it down um, change plants hardscape okay so you want to keep the same substrate that's good because you'd have to tear it down if you wanted to change the substrate so I would actually if the if the livestock are relatively hardy and not not opposed to you kind of getting your hands in there and leave leave all the fish and the shrimp etc in the tank because it's going to probably stress them out even more trying to get them all out and put them in a, in a quarantine tank or something similar so keep your livestock in there I would take all of your hardscape and your plants out while the water is still relatively full. Keep your filter running, that's going to help clear the water. Take all your plants and hardscape out, have a bucket ready, keep your hardscape wet, especially the wood, stop it from drying out. Keep your plants wet, of course, stop them drying out. And then do a huge uh, water change, so siphon out loads of the water, probably leave a couple of inches in the bottom so the fish are fine temporarily. And then what I would do is do your rescape, so put your hardscape in first, then rearrange, do your plants next, top up your tank, it's probably still going to be really cloudy, uh, but then once it's full, then I'd do a couple of big water changes. Just try to keep make, make sure that temperature is in equilibrium so it's not going to shock the fish, and uh, just ensure that the, the water that you're coming out of your tap or your water source is similar to the water that you've just taken out, because that huge massive shift in water parameters water chemistry could shock the fish but if you're doing regular big water changes which I always advocate anyway then that shouldn't be an issue because you know everything should be relatively stable if that makes sense okay um Chris Pyska Pishka hi George how do I measure co2 levels in my 1200 uh I don't actually measure the CO2 in here. I, I, I have a bubble counter. It's probably at about four or five bubbles a second right now because I am using so much light. When I did set it up originally, I used a drop checker, which just gives you an indication of roughly how much CO2 is in the tank. So if it's blue, there's not enough. If it's yellow, there's too much. And if it's like a, like a nice lime green color, it's around, it's around about 30 parts per million. So what I like to do usually is just put the drop checker in for the first couple of weeks make any adjustments to the CO2 to get that green colour and then once that's dialed in with the bubble counter just make a note of the bubbles per second uh, you know what, what gives you that green colour and then I actually take the drop checker out because once that's dialed in and you've got a you know um, a relatively kind of um, consistent circulation pattern all the plants are growing relatively well without algae issues then you know that that bubble rate is fine for that system and I don't really adjust it I have adjusted it recently, just tweaked it up a little bit because we've got more light in there and I just want to get that extra growth from the stem plants. But that's it really. You can, I wrote about this in my book recently, you can do the pH difference method, which is probably a more accurate method. Um, I won't go into detail on that right now because it is quite in depth. Uh, and then there's the pH KH table. So test your pH, test your KH, and then you can look up on the internet CO2 table. But that is relatively inaccurate as well as the drop check is inaccurate as well and the, and the pH KH tables are quite inaccurate because it assumes that carbonic acid is the only form of acid in the aquarium so what happens is when CO2 dissolves in water it creates carbonic acid which drops the pH down and it's this relationship which allows you to use the KH as the constant and then you refer to this table like I said and then you can give it gives you like this reading of CO2 um, but there's other things like nitric acids, humic acids, other kind of acids which are a result of like decomposing organics, etc., um, which will skew the reading. That's why the KH, pH, CO2 tables aren't so accurate. Okay, last question. 
Uh, what are the downsides of pressurized CO2? Uh, it's, this is a good topic, actually. Um, pressurized CO2 is, it's kind of seen as like a really um, challenging, difficult to understand, uh, quite a big step for folk to take in the hobby. And I guess that's, that's not the downside of CO2. That's kind of the downside of people's perception of CO2, I would suggest. So um, it is, you know, if you follow, follow the, the instructions, or I've got a video on how to set up a CO2 kit as well. Um, it's not complicated at all. It's really quite straightforward. If you just break it down into its component parts, pressurized cylinder, regulator, um, solid, uh, needle valve, solenoid bubble counter, diffuser. Make sure you've got, you know, understand how they all work and then just be safe because it is a high, high pressure cylinder. Tommy's barking in the garden. Tommy, Tommy. sis, good boy. Um, yeah, just check out one of my videos. I've done a couple actually on how to set up CO2. I think the, the more recent one's probably better. Uh, but the downsides, I guess, I guess is, it, they're relatively expensive. It is an investment, so that that's probably um, a downside. They do have the potential to kill all of your livestock, which is a massive downside, of course. So if you do accidentally overdose your aquarium water with CO2, you can gas your fish. It is a dangerous uh, system to use as to, you know to actually operate. You know the gases. We're talking really high pressure gases, up to about thirty psi, uh, up to about a thousand psi, about sixty bar. You know if that's not if you're not working with that in a safe environment, then that can be really dangerous. CO two gas itself is toxic to us as well as to fish. It is heavier than air, so if you're working in a confined space like a cabinet and it is leaking pr prolifically, then you can potentially knock yourself out, uh, ultimately lead to death which sounds really um, dramatic, but it, you know, it's true, it's worth bearing in mind. Um, and another downside, it is quite addictive, well, not in terms of taking it, but in terms of using it on your plants, because you see the great results you get from it, you see the fast growth, you see the bigger uh, a variety of plants that you can succeed with with relative ease with a pressurized CO2 kit. So it becomes like, you know, even if you set up um, a nano tank with easy plants, you, you know, you probably want to put CO2 on it because you're used to the great results you get from it. Um, I've actually steered a little bit away from it now. I have, um, this is the only CO2 injected, I have six aquariums up and running now in my home and this is the only one that I'm injecting CO2 in. Um, so I've kind of steered away from that, that high energy kind of uh, methodology that I, I actually kind of really enjoy. Um, but it is much higher maintenance. And I guess that's another downside to CO2 injection is that it does make the plants grow <clears throat> anything from 10 to 20 times, five, or five, between five and 20 times the growth rate you normally get when you inject CO2. So you kind of get used to that, um, which can have, you know, its pros and its cons, more maintenance, but you get, you know, the more kind of instant gratification of seeing the plants grow quicker. So that quite a big answer there, quite a comprehensive uh, topic to cover there, but hopefully, um, hopefully it's all good. Thanks, Candy, for dropping those links. You're epic as always. Um, okay, Th yeah, thanks for modding, Cad Cad Candy and Radu. Uh, okay, guys, let's jump over to some questions. Uh, like I said right at the beginning of the chat, if you do want to, if you do want to drop a super chat, it's always appreciated and I'll do my best to make sure I answer your question. Where do I start? That's the question. Loads of questions. Uh, Andy G, how's the cichlids? They're really good. They're getting really big. Um, shall I show you quickly? We have the technology to do that, I think, without hopefully the audio going wrong or anything. I've told everyone in the house to switch off their Wi-Fi, so I've got all the broadband to myself. So they're getting really big, actually, now. Um, but they are beautiful. Excuse the reflections. 
Check out this male here. And they're greedy. Um, but they're all the same species, the Chindongo Saluzi. And really happy with them. Really love this scape. Reflections are terrible, but you can just see how, how good they're looking. Let's go back how we were. <clears throat> I will do some proper updates of my tanks on my channel, you know, like full on sort of uh, cinematic and things like that, because I do miss creating those for you. Okay, we've got a super chat. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, hi George, is a solenoid essential? Says Matthias Verkauteren. If I add one more after a month, it will it create an imbalance? Love your content and lives. Please check Instagram math scapes. Thank you very much, mate, for the super chat. Um, is a solenoid essential? No, it is not. You can run your CO2 24 seven, but you're, you're basically wasting it. So um, that, there's that. That's probably the number one reason I would suggest using a solenoid. You, you're not gonna create a, a, a massive imbalance. You will get a pH swing uh, but it's gradual because of the nature of CO2 gas in water. It doesn't suddenly change the pH, you know, it changes over a course of a few hours, which doesn't stress the fish or the plants out. So I wouldn't worry at all about using a solenoid. Um, I'd, I'd, in fact, I would recommend solenoids because, um, I mean, I have my lights come on for eight hours a day. My CO2 comes on for a similar amount of time. It just I have it come on a little bit before the lights. So, you, you know, you're saving... 67%, no, you, well, 200, however you want to say it. You're saving a lot of, uh, of CO2, aren't you? So, uh, I think we've got another super chat off um, Mark Dorr, my weekly pocket money. Thanks, mate, appreciate it. Um, MH Aquatics, do you ever do a species-specific tank? Um, not recently, no. I have done a series of biotopes for Practical Fish Keeping Magazine about 10 years or so ago. I did one every month for about a year, I think. And they were kind of a biotope being a, an aquascape based around the habitat of the fish. Um, I have done, I have done an Echinodorus. It was Echinodorus only. I think I may have done an Echinodorus only tank once as well, just for fun. Um, but it, it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, biotopes are great, and I am considering doing a biotope series on the Starline 125. Um, that would be an exciting project. I've, I've really enjoyed getting into writing more. As I've been writing the book, spending more time at home, I'm finding the first few hours in the day are kind of my writing time. So that, that's what I've been doing. And I've, I really want to spend more, maybe more energy and time on writing rather than um, other things. And so I'm digressing. Uh, but I will be doing maybe more kind of species uh, dedicated setups soon with, with, uh, with a view to the biotopes in particular. Uh, thanks, Candy, for the... Yeah, guys, follow me on Instagram if you don't already. George Farmer Studios. Just, I just hit 70,000 followers as well, which is amazing. Um, really great way to engage with you guys. You can, I tend to post at least one, once a day, either a story or a, a, a full-on kind of feed photo. So you can kind of get an insight into what my day-to-day -day activities are at home, etc. on there. Um, CMAF, $499 uh, super chat. Thanks very much, mate. How's it going, buddy? Just wanted to thank you for all the videos and valuable information you share with the community. Cheers from California, USA. Cheers to you. Thank you very much. West Coast. I do need to go to the West Coast of the USA. Uh, let me know in the, in the live chat what's the best stores to visit over in California. I'd really appreciate that. Um, Newman's Aquatics. Hi George, when would you start adding ferts to a new aquascape setup? This is a really great question and depends really on the plants, it depends on the setup. If I'm using a soil substrate, um, my favourite is the Tropica Aquarium soil which tends to have a lot of nutrients already in there. Uh, I might not dose for a week or so uh, but if I'm using largely tissue culture plants I tend to dose very soon, maybe after the first day or so. And the reason for that is that the tissue culture plants are baby plants and just like human babies and animal babies, they need feeding more frequently to grow. They want to grow really quickly. They're kind of biologically programmed to grow really fast. So they need more food more frequently. So that's why I like to dose fertilizers almost from day one 
with the ones who grow all the tissue culture plants. If they're like mother plants or epiphyte plants that have been grown you know, for several weeks, months in the nursery, uh, they're going to have a huge nutrient store in the plant itself. So actually you don't need to uh, necessarily add the fertilizers so early. You could even wait one or two weeks. Um, so there isn't, uh, there isn't a, like a one size answer that fits all there, um, but you can get an idea there about my own personal style. So tissue culture heavy plants for probably from day one or two, and then mainly potted plants probably after the first week or so. Uh, someone's asking about this radiator here. Um, it's actually turned off, so that's no problem. Appreciate the concern. Uh, Jordan Simmons, please come to the Southeast USA to do your book tour. Absolutely. Uh, Mark Dor, what's one species of fish you've never kept that you would love to? That's a really good question. There's, there's loads of, I mean, I've, there's loads of fish I haven't kept. Um, and because of my kind of um, bias towards aquascape and friendly fish, um, I would have to say there's some, some really kind of rare tetras out there, which look absolutely stunning, which I haven't kept. I can't think of the species name at the moment. There's a really great store in a really great shop in Wigan called Pier Aquatics. And they tend to specialize in these really rare South American fish and tetras especially. So, and I'll tell you what, actually, uh, if, if I had the right size aquarium, Altum Angels and, or Wild Discus, but I would personally only keep Altums in a tank that's at least three feet tall, 90 centimeters tall, so they can grow to their full potential. Uh, and probably the same with Wild Discus, just because to do them justice, to get that sense of scale, you would arguably need a huge aquarium. You know, for me, obviously, the, the welfare of the fish is paramount, so that needs to, the aquarium needs to be big enough to keep the fish comfortable. But as an aquascaper who's more, who's really focused on the aesthetics, I think it's really important that the fish don't look too big for the aquarium. You know, arguably, the, the Malawi cichlids now in that Awaze uh, Highline 175 are starting to look a bit big for the actual size aquarium. Biologically, they're absolutely fine. We're doing, I say we, because Harrison, my stepson, tends to do all the water changes at the moment. But he's doing at least two 75% water changes a week in there. And we have a Biomaster 600 thermo filter, which is more than enough to keep on top of the water quality. But in terms of the aesthetics, what I'm saying is, you know, uh, that's a real big consideration. You know, do the fish size suit the, so they suit the size of the aquarium? Uh, JH Aquatics, thank you so the super chat, mate. We just got one before you. C Math, what's the par level of the substrate of your tank here? It's probably around 50, I would guess. Probably more like 75 at the moment with uh, extra light on there. JH Aquatics, thanks for the super chat, mate. Um, yes, check out J Aquatics YouTube channel. Really great guy. I think he's from Bermuda. Let me know if, if that's right. Uh, super nice guy and yeah hopefully I'll see you at the next Aquashella. I know it's originally programmed for August but with Corona I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, maybe that'll be postponed. Um, Milos, Marcus, thanks George for the positive vibes at this time. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, D-name Somnia. Oh, DNA Insomnia 84. Ever thought of doing a saltwaterscape with macro algae? I've already done it. Yay! Um, no, I did that in about 10 years ago. Yeah, it's quite a well known um, aquascape actually. It was in a Fluval Roma, I want to say a 125, and it had uh, just live rock in there. I had some macro algae, a different species of macro algae, and some Bangai cardinal fish. I did a feature on it for Practical Fishkeeping magazine. There's even a video of it. I'm pretty sure there's a video of it on my channel somewhere. So if, if someone can be bothered to find that and link, that'd be great. So it'd probably be a, t a terrible quality video taken with an old school compact camera. Um, but I have done. I have done reef. 
Uh, yeah, Radu. I think I need to take one of my mods to Cali, California, on my book tour. Absolutely. Um, where were I getting distracted? I can't remember where, where I was going. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, uh, reef, reef tanks. So originally, I was going to set up a reef in here uh, in collaboration with Aquarium Connections, who are the UK distributor for Triton products. And they also custom build uh, bespoke high high spec uh, reef tanks and freshwater uh, for for clients around the UK and internationally. And we were going to work together. And the original plan was that I was going to have a full on running four foot by two foot by two foot Triton system uh, running in the gallery. There's no room for that right now, and because of lockdown, <clears throat> that you know that hasn't come into fruition. I've been so busy on the book and before the lockdown I was traveling so much so that it hasn't come about I'm not ruling it out um, and it's something I've been considering for years you know I do love reef aquariums I love marine biology I have a couple of uh, marine biology and reef reef aquarium books up there and you know it, I am interested in all things aquatic whether it's freshwater plants you know or corals or you know mackerel algae or whatever so I'm not ruling it out, but at the moment it's just put on hold uh, until further notice. <clears throat> oh, a couple more uh, super chats. Ghetto Farm Farmulus ever smashed a tank accidentally when escaping? Have I ever smashed a tank accidentally while escaping? No. Emma, I've never smashed a tank, have I? Never smashed a tank while escaping? No. No. I'll tell you what I have done though, is smashed loads of glassware, whether it's the lily pipes, the inlets, when you're cleaning them out with the hose brushes, I've smashed the, the glass, little, the little glass U-bends you can get for CO2 uh, line. I've smashed glass diffusers. Basically anything that's made from glass in the aquarium I've smashed, apart from the aquarium itself. So. Maybe I should be thankful for that. Uh, no Way Out 2004-2003. Thank you for the super chat. Best plants for an Iwagumi setup? It's really down to you. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure your system is capable of growing those plants. So make sure you've got enough light. If you're using CO2, do you have a good substrate, fertilizers, etc. The main thing is lighting and CO2, I would suggest. So make sure your system is is capable of growing the chosen plants and then and then it's just down to taste you know do you want to go for a minimalist iwagumi like a zen style so maybe just one species of carpeting plant or do you want to go for a, a more kind of um, fully planted setup my highline 85 has ballast growing in the background and it's quite heavily planted um, so it's really down to your tastes and whether or not you can grow those plants um, yeah, so it's hard for me to actually point out the, the best plants. But for the traditional kind of what people consider a, you know, a, a classic iwagumi, you want to stick with the carp, classic carpeting species. Uh, Hamianthus cuba, Eleocaris, Sicularis mini, uh, Micranthum and Monte Carlo, even things like Elatine hydropiper. Uh, even if you can, this is the one plant that I can never grow I am going to succeed with it at one point. Utricularia graminifolia. Uh, I've never been able to grow that. Let me know in the chat if you can grow it and how did you grow it because it's always melted on me. So, yeah. Anyway, there's just some ideas for you there. Thank you for the super chat. No way out. Uh, okay, this is a good question. Up. Uh, Uplicks for a 120 by 45 by 45 centimeter. How many external filters do I recommend? If it is only one, which filters do you prefer? Um, actually, this aquarium is slightly bigger than that. This is 120 by 60 front to back by 45 tall, and I'm only running one filter on this. And I would, I was running two, but I'm just using the Biomaster 600 Thermo, and that, as you can see, is doing the job really well. So that would be my recommendation. Go for the Biomaster 600 Thermo if you can get it, the Oase uh, filter. 
and it has the built-in heater which is great so you don't have to have a heater in the aquarium it has a quick release pre-filter which is a game changer for really easy uh, filter maintenance and if you find that's not enough circulation for your requirements then you could either add a power head is a really cheap way of getting more circulation in the aquarium or add another smaller external filter potentially uh, CMAF, what is the best substrate to use for planting? Thank you so much for the super chat, CMAF. Um, I really like uh, Tropica Aquarium Soil. It's a proven performer for me. I've probably used it in probably nearly 100 setups now, either for myself or for clients or for commercial, uh, for companies. Um, it's in here as well. It's in here. It's in my new Highline... Uh, Starline 125, it's in my Starline 85 and it's in my flu valve flex. Uh, I really love it, it's consistent, consistently good, I know it grows the plants well, um, I know if I do large frequent water changes in the first four weeks I never get algae issues, uh, it grows the plants well and I just said that, um, yeah proven performer and that's, my, that's why it's my favourite. Whoa, loads of questions coming in. Oh, Steve killing back music. Super chat sent at 1940 as unanswered. Uh, sorry, mate. Let me see if I can find it. Ah, here we go. Steve killing back music. Hi, Steve. Steve, my mate from Norwich. And I know Steve from Scape Nature. How can I plant from day one in ADA Amazonia without harm? You just... You just plant in it, mate. You know, ADA Amazonia is a great substrate. Um, just plant in there, but make sure you do those large frequent water changes for the first few weeks. Ideally, I would be doing a three-quarter water change, 75% water change every day for the first few days, and then gradually uh, reduce the amount and the frequency. But you want to be doing at least a 50% water change I would suggest every couple of days, every three days for the first four weeks. But that first week, really, really do those big water changes. That's not going to do any harm uh, to your plants. Um, you're going to get an ammonia spike, but that's why you do those massive water changes. Uh, but don't and don't stock any fish until you you know you, you might need to buy an ammonia test kit and just make sure that the ammonia is, is undetectable and nitrite level is undetectable before you stock any fish as well and shrimp. Okay, let's go to what, what time are we on everyone? Uh, 19, five. we've got another 10 minutes or so guys. Thank you so much for all these super chats and all these great questions coming through, really appreciate it. Um, Deepak Sahi, uh, thanks for super chat. Tips to balance CO2 light and ferts in a 6.8 gallon tank. Well, you can apply this. It doesn't really matter about the size of the tank. You, you know, any size tank, you can apply these principles of balancing the CA2 light and ferts. First of all, I would... It, it, basically, let's start from scratch. Let, let's, let's assume that you haven't got a light yet for it. Um, so you buy your light according... This is my own advice... Buy your light according to the demands of the most demanding plant that you want to aquascape with. So you, you come, up, come up with an aquascape plan, come up with a plant species list, figure out which one of those is the most demanding plant, and then get your light to suit that. Okay, so that's your number one thing. So you start off with your light, and then depending on how bright that light is, depends on how much CO2 and nutrients you need. Nutrients is easy. You can just use a, a variation of the estimative index method, which is what I do. I just add an all-in-one liquid fertilizer. My personal uh, favorite is Tropica Specialized Nutrition. There are other brands that are available. I just add that every day. I deliberately add a little bit too much for the plants. So let's say the plants need, you know, two milliliters a day, one squirt a day. I'll probably add two. So do that every day and then do a big water change at least once a week, at least 50% once a week. I actually do more right now because I'm at home and I've got the time. In fact, I get Harrison, my stepson, to do them. Um, that looks after your nutrients. So you don't need to think about balancing the nutrients with anything else because you're, you're, at, 
it's, it's what's called the estimative of index. You don't need to test the water. You dose deliberately dosing, you know, religiously every day, doing a big water change every week, so everything stays good for the plants. And then you just need to tweak your CO2. So I would actually aim for 30 parts per million CO2. So use a drop checker to get that. Um, I actually did a video on how to test CO2 using the drop checker. So check that out. And then you back to your lighting. So you've got enough light to grow your most demanding plant. You've got good CO2. You've got good nutrients. And then there you go. Everything should be in balance. The number one tip above all of that is to make sure when you do get your plants, make sure they're as healthy as possible, make sure you buy enough of them, and make sure you look after them with um, the three things we just talked about, light, CO2 and nutrients, and good maintenance practice, which is the water changes, keeping on top of your filter maintenance, and just keeping everything kind of clean and well looked after. Thank you for the super chat. I hope that answers your question. Quite a long one, that. Okay, this is a good question from Frank Veg Vegman or Wegman. Hi George, thanks so much for sharing all of your knowledge. How often do you clean the main unit of your Biomaster filter and how? Did you ever share that? Many thanks, Frank. Now this is um, this could potentially be a bit embarrassing. I have never cleaned the main unit of my filter in here. This has been running for about three years and I've only ever cleaned the pre-filter and the attachment that the hose comes to because that gets clogged up with, with dirt. I've never actually taken it apart and cleaned the filter media inside it. I religiously clean the pre-filter at least once a week. Again, I get Harrison to do that now, uh, sometimes twice a week. And that, that in theory, prevents any, any kind of mechanical waste, any, any um, decaying matter, anything from getting into that main unit <coughs> excuse me so i haven't cleaned it yet and i should do and i'm aware of it and actually i might do some um, on the job training with harrison so he can clean it as well with me and he can do it from future let us know in the live chat guys have you got a my biomaster filter and how often do you actually clean the main uh, media inside The famous aquarist, that's a great name. How does the big water changes affect the cycling of a tank? Thanks for the work you do for the aquarium hobby. Um, that, that's a good question. Basically, it's, it's, a quite, a, it's quite a, uh, it could be, could go down lots of rabbit holes with this question. So I'll try to keep it simple and straightforward. If you're cycling a tank in the traditional sense of adding a, a efficiency cycling by adding an artificial source of ammonia to populate the beneficial bacteria, etc., by doing a huge water change, you're obviously diluting that ammonia. So your bacteria levels may build up more slowly. So that's probably the number one impact. But I will just say, you know, from my own experience, and I do really advocate always having a planted aquarium and planting it heavily from the outset, you don't need to officially see cycle the aquarium or go through a regular cycle because the plants almost do it for you. Um, so just very briefly, you know, you've got a brand new aquarium, a brand new filter, put soil in there, put loads of plants in there, preferably some fast growers, fill it up get those plants growing for a week or so. Lots of water changes, especially if you've got a soil which is leaching ammonia. That ammonia is gonna help cycle the filter. The plant growth is gonna help cycle the filter. The plants themselves are producing organics. Those organics are gonna start feeding bacteria. That bacteria is eventually gonna populate the filter. Um, the, the nature of the plants growing, um, they use nitrogen as a food source. So after a week or so, when you're, uh, you know, if you've got, um, substrates leaching ammonia once all that's gone your filter is probably going to be half mature anyway add your fish those if they if and when those fish produce ammonia that ammonia is going to be taken care of by the by the filter media already and also by the plant growth and that's really why i love to plant heavily from the outset because it really helps to deal with any fish waste right from the start so all of all of my aquariums at home right now apart from the cichlid tank 
I didn't use any fishless cycling. I, I just planted heavily and then I added the fish a few weeks later. In fact, in the here, in the AquaCube, I have one nearite snail and two cherry shrimp. There's no filter on there. There's new soil, but I'm doing uh, at least a 75% water change on there twice a week. The fish are absolutely fine. Uh, the fish, the, the, shrimp, the shrimp are fine. Snail's happy. And I think that just proves, you know, that the system works. Thanks for Super Chat. Oh, you didn't leave one, but thanks for the question anyway. Appreciate it. Okay, 310 people watching and 149 likes. If if I get to, let's do a little thing. If I get to 200 likes in the next five minutes, I'll stay on for a little bit longer. <laughs> if you don't hit the like, it know, I know that I'm not entertaining enough for you, so I'd say cheerio. <laughs> uh, Alex Niebenen, thank you. Really, look, really, looking, really hard looking forward to your book. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it coming out as well. Uh, Gordon Simmons home for a home setup. Thanks for the super chat, guys. By the way, uh, for a home setup, do I prefer traditional lights that sit on the tank or pendant lights that hang over the tank, and why? Uh, I prefer, if I could, for a traditional home. I mean, what is traditional home? That that's quite a kind of ambiguous um, kind of thing. Um, if it was me, I would actually prefer lights hanging from the ceiling. Um, but, it, you know, it's all down to taste, really. You know, what, what do you want to see? Um, and what do you think would look best for you? Uh, that's the key, finding out that and then go from there. Um, I've kept pendant lights before hanging from the ceiling. I've kept pendants from hanging from like an arm that sits over the side of the tank. And then now I've got these ones that sit on top of the tank like this. Um, one of the kind of disadvantages I find with the pendant lights hanging from the ceiling is that the, the electrical cables look a little bit unsightly. Um, but actually, this is interesting. I'm actually getting a couple of Chihiros lights sent over, the Vivid RGB2. Um, so hopefully they'll turn up fairly soon and I'm going to fit some lighting arms uh, and, and have those on here. So it'll be interesting to test those out. Okay, um, do we get, have we got 200, well, we've rocketed to 200 likes now, <laughs> so we'll stay on a little bit longer. Uh, thanks for smashing that like button, I really appreciate it. A little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, bribery there, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank, yeah, can, poor Candy, she's been asking people to hit the like button and you haven't, and then when I, I promise to stay on longer, then you like it. So yeah, I, I can't complain, guys. I really appreciate you watching. Uh, this is the Danilo sponge here. Um, I'm not on commission. It's not a sponsored video. I genuinely like, well, I genuinely like all the stuff that I talk about, even if it's sponsored. That's why they're a sponsor. Um, but this is a great product. Recommend it. Um, it is quite expensive for what it is. I would suggest, but um, the, the, one of the best I've ever used, really great for cleaning stubborn marks off your glass, hard water marks, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, really, really great. I'll get mine from Aquarium Gardens uh, because um, Dave, shout out to Dave if he's watching. Um, he's my local aquascaping store, so I can just nip in and get them where, whenever I like, so it's perfect. It doesn't scratch, no, it doesn't scratch the glass. It'll scratch acrylic. So don't use it on acrylic, but it won't scratch glass. Uh, Robert Pritchard, love your videos. You're so inspirational. Starting my first aquascaping. That's brilliant. Um, thank you for the comment. I really appreciate that. Am I looking forward to Wednesday? What's happening on Wednesday? Well, I don't actually know what's happening Wednesday. Let me know in the comments. What's happening Wednesday? 200 likes, two dislikes, boo. Do I have a dream tank? So there's dream and then there's actually what's achievable, isn't there? Two different things. Um, we talked already about like an outer angel tank, maybe wild discus. You know, if and when we move home, uh, it won't be any time soon. Um, 
but I would I would like to have one really large full time display, you know, long term, like keep it going for years, and then I would just have you know two or three, depending on my current situation, but have a couple of smaller aquariums to, to you know to create new aquascapes over and over. Um, because I, you know, I love that creative process, but I really like the idea of having a massive tank, which is there, you know, fully plumbed in, auto water change, everything automatic, Felix Smart, you know, everything, you know, labour free almost. Just feed the fish, trim the plants when I need to, um, and that would be in the region of sort of eight foot by three foot by three foot, maybe even four foot deep, and then have you know some beautiful Altim angels in there really kind of Amazonian themed, massive bits of driftwood, maybe not even any stones, you know, massive Echinodorus or maybe, maybe even Crips. I know they're not kind of continent um, compatible. You know, obviously, uh, Altam Angels come from the Amazon and Discus and Crips come from Southeast Asia, a lot of them from Sri Lanka, in fact. Um, but yeah, that would be, that'd be my dream. A massive tank dedicated to, you know, like a really nice beautiful feature fish with the potential to last years and years. Oh, we've got another super chat. Thank you so much, Mike Ellis. Uh, MH Aquatics really wants to know if you have ever built your own aquarium. Uh, no. Have I ever built my own aquarium? No, I haven't, no. And my first ever aquarium was a Jewel, Rio 125. And then I've had many, many tanks since then. I actually helped um, the Aquascaper tank uh, brand launch and, and promoted those guys for a couple of years. I work closely with Awaze now. This is an Aquascaper tank. I've got a flu valve flex. Um, I've got to be really honest with you. I'm not actually a very practical person, as my wife will allude to. <laughs> um, and my DIY skills have improved over the last few years, but actually the thought of building a tank is actually quite scary for me. Um, I, I wouldn't like to say I'd mess it up. I'd, I'd make a good go of it and if I had the right equipment and the right tuition and I'm sure I could succeed. But you know, I, I, I'm in a very for, fortunate position that brands are happy uh, to support me by give, you know, providing aquariums for me to use. And so that's what I do. Um, nothing against custom build aquariums or DIY built aquariums at all. Um, but my my kind of the, the way I do business, the way I kind of have my hobby is that I tend to use um, pre you know pre built aquariums. Um, I find they're more accessible. They're obviously more probably more expensive, um, but yeah, that's why I do that. If I did go for a massive custom built tank, like I mentioned earlier, that would be custom built. Um, I do have some friends in the industry um, that would probably build them for me, and we'd probably do some sort of kind of collaboration on that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one, tank building. I was quite heavily involved with the kind of uh, engineering behind it all when I worked on the Aquascaper brand. So I do know a little bit about it. Um, it's very interesting. But yeah, at the moment, I just use, um, you know, pre-built tanks from companies. Oh, apologies. Wednesday, I'm on with Tom. That's right. On the Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I'm going to shout out to the Tropical Fishkeeping UK group. If Candy can drop a link for that, that'd be really helpful. So Wednesday, 7.30 UK time, I will be going live on there, on the Tropical Fish Keeping UK group. So make sure you join that group if you can. If you're on Facebook, great group, 50,000, well, I think 55,000 members on there now. Great group of admin, great group of moderators. Uh, really well run and um, active Facebook group, you know, there's literally hundreds of Facebook groups, if not thousands, to do with aquariums, and it is one of one of my favourites because it's got the combination of being so big, um, but well run. And I like to I go on there quite quite frequently and answer a few kind of beginner questions. I really like to engage with the beginners, show them a bit of inspiration, hopefully from my own aquariums as well. Um, and it's just great to kind of almost like grassroots level stuff. So really looking forward to doing a live stream with those guys at half past seven on Wednesday. Thanks for the link, uh, Candy. Mary Page Flynn, hello. One of my most active commentators at the moment on my channel. I really appreciate all your lovely comments. Mark Dorr, when's the Boyob Air Rescape coming? 
I need to get a new lid for it. So when I put the lid down, it just mists constantly. So I need to get my uh, butt into gear and give the guys a call and get a new lid sent over. Uh, Anthony Perry, thoughts on the Ultim Nature Systems brand and their all-in-one fert. I uh, really like the guys over at UNS, worked with them closely when I was over in the States in Chicago. They supported a huge workshop. I did a workshop with the Chicago Aquatic Plant Society. <clears throat> it was over the same weekend as Aquashella in Chicago and those guys uh, had a great booth and they supplied loads of plants for us along with Tropica and they supplied the tank which was a 60N I think. Beautiful, beautiful equipment. Um, seen a lot of their gear being used at Aquarium Design Group in Texas as well. So yeah, big big fan of those guys. Um, yeah, it'd be good to see if they come over to the UK at some point. Okay, guys, I'm going to take a couple more questions. Um, just make sure I've not missed out any super chats. 300 people watching. That's great. 228 likes. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to say. Cheerio, yeah, okay, I'll say cheerio because I won't know when to stop answering questions. Thanks so much for, for asking your questions and thank you so much for the super chats, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, am, I am planning on doing this regularly every Sunday at 7pm UK time, so if you can find time in your schedules to join me, that would be much appreciated and do share the streams if you can. It, it hopefully will stay on my channel if you join the stream late and you want to watch all the Q&As from the beginning, then do consider re-watching it and sharing it with others as well. Thanks to all the lovely comments. Thanks to all the answers and the great Q&As that have been going on behind the scenes. Um, and just a, a final message to say, I hope everyone's well and healthy. We're still going through this uh, coronavirus pandemic period, um, but just try to use it as a positive. Uh, enjoy your... <coughs> Uh, I'm not going to start getting upset. <laughs> enjoy your aquariums even more. You know, stay at home. Uh, enjoy the therapeutic of, of aquariums and aquascaping in particular. Uh, support your local stores if you can afford it. I realise a lot of people's income has, has suffered considerably during the lockdown. Um, but try to support your local dealers, your local stores, your local shops. And um, those guys are really struggling. Um, you know, buy more hardscape, buy more plants. Rescape your tanks if you can, and even if you can't afford that, if you've got zero budget, then consider rescaping your tank anyway. You know, just move some plants around, move the hardscape around. You know, one of the earlier questions from the Q and A was how to rescape um, without changing the substrate. So maybe rewind and and then um, you can hear how we did that. Um, so yeah, just stay safe, stay at home if you can, wash your hands frequently, enjoy your aquariums. Look after each other. You take care. Keep on scaping. Cheerio.